welcome back. I'm sure many of you, just like myself, just finished watching this fantastic uh, review of the Lee Chess 4040, rather 4545 League games, in which six games were selected, um, both based on just their general appeal as well as their instructive value. Um, and uh, International Master Astana just finished this fantastic review of these games. However, in the five hours we allotted, there were only so many questions that could be answered. And I'm sure many of you, like myself, are curious um, just what other secrets these games hold. So with that, I am going to do some supplemental review, uh, direct you to uh, his video if you if I can find it, I'm sure I can. Um, so go ahead and watch that first, and then my remarks will attempt to supplement those that he made. Uh, so that said, Lee Chess offers the ability for you to clone a study and add your own remarks to it. So I'm going to do so. Here we go. Um, so there are six games here. Um, here they are in the order that they did, were studied. Uh, let me see how many of these... Okay. You can actually see the chapters, you can see the move list and so forth. Good. Um, so I think the later we get into these games, I might just skim over the first few because these are studied pretty extensively. Uh, we spent, I think, the most time on these games, and um, I don't think there were any end games in the first two or three games. Um, at least if I'm remembering correctly. So, yeah, this game concluded before there was time for an endgame. Astana did a fantastic job analyzing this. I don't think I had any additional remarks for it. Let me pass through it one more time to see if there's anything I wanted to point out. He did cover the opening quite thoroughly, or exhaustively, rather, um, more than thoroughly. Uh, during the game, there were some questions raised about this V4 idea in general. However, tactically, he pointed out that it did not work. Um, Bishop h3 is excellent because it develops white's pieces. Um, yeah, no, I think he did a fantastic job covering this, and I don't think I have anything to add to his remarks. Um, and yeah, during the lecture, he pointed out the errors with my ideas, so that was good. Uh, let's move on to game two. Uh, so this is a selected game for board five of the 45-45 week. Um, yeah, I'm not so familiar with White's opening here. Uh, one thing I did observe in general in the first few games is that these tend to be flashbang, really exciting games because both player, well, one player develops all their pieces, and the other player lags behind a bit, and so there's fewer mysteries to be solved here. Um, I was actually of the opinion that King H8 seemed reasonable. Uh, if I'm trying to remember, yeah, Bishop B5. I was looking at this during the lecture and I couldn't figure out um, does Black have any, any alternative to Bishop C6? Uh, certainly, Bishop B5 prevents a queen exchange, but that's not to say that White has fully equalized here, or that White's in any way in the clear. Uh, I know that he. Astana analyzed this using a computer, so I'm probably not going to discover many surprising things. Um, but I don't really like this idea of bishop c6. Um, I much prefer the idea of like knight f6 and trying to keep all the pieces on the board. Even though white's got a space advantage, I think um, black's piece mobility does stand for something here. Um, but I could probably trust that Astana didn't miss anything too critical. Um, obviously, black still got this idea of rook c2 going on in the position. It's pretty easily parried, both by bishop c1 um, and by knight c4. But black's got plenty of potential ideas with um, just these really active pieces he has. In, in contrast, white's bishop is on the same color square as his pawns, at least the queen side pawns. So that kind of limits the bishop's mobility on the queen side. On the other hand, this bishop stands in the way of the e or this pawn stands in the way of e7 bishop, and it's not so easy to move that pawn because that would cut off the bishop on b7. Uh, so I think White's probably doing fine. 
Uh, I'm going to turn on the engine briefly. Uh, it's suggesting... Right. Oh, is it really suggesting rook c2, just like I suggested here? Yeah, I didn't like this idea of bishop c6. Um, the engine happens to like rook c2. I'm more curious, though, what if we happen to try to keep all the pieces on? What's so wrong with this idea? So white takes f5. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This knight is defended on d2. Okay, so yeah, knight f6 is not worth considering. Or at least it doesn't work out. But rook c2 um, bears some pressure on white's position before he's finished developing. And so we exchange down. Um, oh, yeah, you got this intermezzo. Uh, or into a mezzo. And let's see. Then bishop a3, and then we take f3, and we take back. Oh, Zug, you've got to. Don't let that spoil. Uh, I know that in America there's plenty of cheese, but um, because there's a global cheese um, boom, or what is it? Not a boom, a surplus. So, okay, I'm just going along with the first few moves that's chucking out. Oh, that's the key. Okay. Wait. But after rook e3, can't I take d4? Um, but I'm starting to see how white might be okay here. Uh, so we take, we take. White finally develops his remaining rook. Bishop e5 constrains that rook, or limits its mobility. Um, now we get the bishop. Oops, not there. How do I delete a move? Damn mouse. Um, how do I delete this move? Okay. Yeah, bishop c1. Uh, d5 does try to constrain the rook a little bit more. But white does have the bishop pair, so presumably white's okay here. Stockfish gives white a small plus. But that answers my question about, like, okay, well, first of all, let me get rid of this move. Um, so yeah, rook c2 is an interesting alternative, but not quite good enough. Um, oh, and so therefore... Um, instead of bishop c6, Stockfish recommended, well, for a while it recommended rook takes c2. For a while I think it also recommended pawn takes e4. But pawn takes e4 is just so lifeless in terms of endgame, because look at the pawn structure. Um, so we take, white takes, um, I mean, just check this out. There's just the symmetry over here. And symmetrical pawn endgames with symmetrical pieces tend not to be very exciting. Um, so, um, so that's a way that white, or black could equalize there. Um, however, black ended up playing bishop c6. Yeah. Yeah, now I have to give this move a question mark, because it's, it gives white considerable initiative and trades off black's best piece. So... Yeah, I really don't like this. How do I annotate with symbol question mark? There we go. That was missing. Um, so E takes. Yeah, I think we saw the rest of the game. It was pretty flashy and awesome, and Astana covered it really well. Did I have any remarks before we got to there? Um, yeah, I think in the game there was rook A8 to B8 to C8, which is kind of a waste of a move. Um, just going one square at a time. Rooks can move multiple squares at, um, at once, believe it or not. Yeah, and black misses a chance. Yeah, this analysis is very thorough. So with that, uh, let's move on to the board four game. Um, okay, so we've got a Dutch going on. Um, I think another way to achieve the Dutch, or I'm sorry, um, what kind of complicates the Dutch in some situations is if white plays um, bishop g5, denying black the ability to easily play e6. Um, and note that if white try or black tries to get clever here, 
Um, I'm trying to remember the move order, but the idea is that e3 and queen h5 can be a thing. And a real, a very real thing at that. Uh, I think this has to go first, but then g5 doesn't quite work out. Um, and I'm forgetting. I wish I could remember the exact move order, but um, so this bears this threat on h5. Um, black has to counter it. Let's just double check this with the computer just to see. I mean, yeah, bishop h4 is fine. Then g5. Oh, and then e4 is even stronger. Um, or yeah, bishop g3, actually. I, I did remember bishop g3. I just thought that my memory was faulty. But yeah, no, bishop g3 is the book move. And note that f4 uh, loses a pawn to e3. And otherwise, um, we get sort of that Cairo position that we were looking at earlier, but this is just so full of holes, black can never castle king's side. And so he's already ruled out half of his possible ideas as to where his king could go, and he's not developed a single piece yet. Um, and I guess, yeah, maybe he could do knight f6 to try to develop a piece, but, well, actually, let's take a look. Yeah, I was going to say book move was not to move the knight, but it was to move e6. But what happens if he tries to move the knight? Um, e3. And yeah, black has just recklessly moved away his pawns that could have defended his king. Um, I guess it's playable, but you won't find anybody trying to do this. And it's just sketchy. You've moved uh, four pawns in a knight. And it's white's move. I, I'm, well, okay, so white's only moved one bishop. But this is just so incredibly loose, and white's play is so flexible against it that you would have to play very accurately to try to hold that. Um, it, you're going to be up and you're going to be facing a lot of pressure. Um, in a sense, up a creek without a paddle there. <laughs> um, well, okay, you could argue that 1f5 is, I mean, you could say the Dutch is bad. I mean, you've seen Nakamura play it. I forget if Carlsen's played it or not. I mean, a lot of strong players have played it during their careers. Um, yeah, I mean, one could argue that. Um, I'm not going to bother to argue against it. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise for the student to figure out whether f5 is refuted or not. Um, but it's not the favored move in this position. Like if I go to the opening explorer, as Astano is suggesting, you can actually pick, I just want to see master games and show me where f5 is on this list. So black has scored 24%, which is about the same he scores, um, or he's won 24%, which is about the same he wins with knight f6. Uh, and he's drawing 37% versus 43 with knight f6. So it's kind of popular. Um, on the other hand, of all these moves that black could select from, it scores pretty much the worst. Um, but, you know, everybody's got their own style and their way of playing it. And if white plays accurately here, out of these top moves, he's winning about 40% of the time. Um, I guess white doesn't play these. Uh, I mean, he's tried e4, he's tried all these other things. Let's progress another move. What do I think is strongest against the Dutch? Um, just based on my experience and my knowledge. I was advocating bishop g5, so I'm actually going to go with that. Uh, it does kind of help my cause that white's scoring 44% from here, because black doesn't really know it that well. Um, but let's say black does play soundly. Um, I don't know, what move would you play here? Um, I really like bishop g5, though. It makes black's life difficult. I know just because it's statistically best doesn't mean it's actually the best move, but um, 
Okay, well, what would a strong player play here? Let's scroll down to the top game section. We've got Carlson losing in 2012. We've got Topolov losing in 2011. We've got Ponomaryov uh, actually beating Rajabov. So let's take a look at that. I know this is digressing way off the beaten path, but let's take a look. Um, oops, let's go back. This has progressed this way, e3, d6. Uh, knight d2, um, h4. h4 is a bit presumptive here. I don't like it. Um, anyhow. See, I guess h6 is the way to go there, because white can choose to play h4 and make his life difficult. Is h4 really the best move here? I guess it's the only move, um, but that said, I really don't like the system at all. It's only been played seven times, and of that, well, we're looking at the only loss with the system, but this is the game between strong players. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I don't know. I guess... So I guess you can't extend, or at least I've failed to extend, the idea to f5 being a terrible move on the outset. Maybe f5 is a terrible move, but I just can't prove it. Um, let me just make sure I'm able to get back to where I came from here. So, yeah, I have failed to prove that f5 is ridiculous, but the um, most popular move is g3 here. I guess we could just go with g3 and explore this and um, see like if black plays something reasonable like we got Caruana, Carlson that was played last year uh, we could take a look at black winning that it doesn't say the time controls of these games but um, yeah you don't see these things very often um, Usually black plays a less risky opening. Something that actually, I mean, unless you're playing relay chess, um, your bishop isn't going to be developed any better by this pawn having moved. None of your pieces will have any more mobility for the fact that this f5 was played. And even in relay chess, um, only your bishop would be able to develop and it'd only be able to go one square at a time here, so it's not the best developing move there either. But anyway, I digress. I was trying to figure out, did I have any more comments on the opening that I had ready to share? As opposed to, can we prove something that's really difficult to prove just for the sake of trying to do it for fun? Um, so knight of three, castle, castle, c4. Yeah, I guess I don't really know very much in this opening. So I don't have very much to add to the opening. Um, this does now at this point sort of look like a stone wall ish sort of pawn structure there. If black were able to get his other knight over to f6 and start pushing these pawns, that could be trouble. On the other hand, he did spend a tempo playing a5. So he's, black's declaring his intent to advance on the queen side and on the king side and in the center. So black's pushing on all fronts at the same time and kind of neglecting his peace development. Um, um, yeah, so I see Astana comments that a4, continuing queenside operations might have been best. Um, I guess, yeah, I think black doesn't want to push on all fronts at the same time. So if, if he says, I'm not gonna push d5 right away, that probably serves him well. Um, it's really a good idea to move all your pieces, and this actually does help activate his a8 rook. And it seems that white has kind of created... Well, white's position on the king side is flexible because he's only moved a single pawn. So he's got choices of whether he wants to play f3 or e3 later. Um, and uh, in general, white's going to... Well, I don't know what white's doing. White's got a lot of flexibility but the double fee and keto system is pretty slow. Um, Astano knows this better than I do, but 
So we take, take, yeah, I don't know this. Let's, let's go back to stuff that I might be able to comment on. Um, yeah, I agree. So, knight d7. Oh, that's what I was saying here, is like, can't black stir up some trouble with uh, just playing this as if it were a reversed, um, shoot, what was it? A reversed stonewall. Um, now, one thing in the stonewall is that you want to be able to um, actually develop like this. You don't want to lose the e5 square in a stonewall. Um, but black's already lost that e5 square. And furthermore, if you do lose e5 or e4 in the stone wall, um, you don't want your opponent to occupy it with a piece. You'd rather that if they have something there and you can't displace it at all, you'd rather that, that be a pawn than a piece. Um, so black is, uh, this is not going to do very well in terms of a stone wall sorts of battle where black pushes on the king's side and tries to mate. That's not going to work out. Um, so that leaves me really curious. What's our evaluation? Okay, white's ahead half a pawn-ish. Um, just to, as a rough positional approximation. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything really clever for black. Um, he's going to need to develop... Um, I know I criticized in these this series that uh, the players did not develop all their pieces very quickly. Uh, most of these games were a blowout from the looks of it, but that's just my appearance. Um, well, no, I'm saying like if White's playing a stone wall, he doesn't want to lose e4, and if Black's playing a reverse stone wall, he doesn't want to lose e5. Um, now, it, I mean. If your opponent's halfway competent, they will plunk a piece in the center, and your whole fantasy of giving checkmate in the opening is not going to work. But, like, yeah, if you have some sort of fantasy that it's going to work somehow, and that you're going to push and throw everything all in and try to go for mate, that's the general idea, is you don't want to give up the center. Um, but, yeah, obviously chess is not solved in that particular opening as being a win for either, well, at least not for the attacker with the, who played the king pawn, or I'm sorry, king bishop pawn to king bishop four. Um, so, yeah, that, that tends not to work out. Um, but if you do have some aspirations to go that way, as apparently black does here, because he's playing this, Usually in like a King's Indian sort of position, your aspiration's not... Well, this isn't a King's Indian, because he played... He did not play G6. Um, I was going to say, there's some ideas of like dropping the knight over this way. Or even to C5, although that's not feasible on account of this pawn being in the way. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to see where he's going to develop, and I... I guess trading a set of pieces without any clear plan is okay. Um, but I really hesitate to trade when there's any way I can complicate the position or try to provide myself some more winning chances. This looks really, mm, I don't know, not very ambitious for black. And that's kind of ironic given that you're playing against a system where white's being owed both bishops and kind of concede at the center. You should be able to do something to make this interesting. Um, and maybe this is still interesting, but I really don't like the peace trade. That knight on e5 wasn't going anywhere, that knight on f3 wasn't going anywhere, because if the knight on f3 moved, then you just snap on e5. And if white decides that he wants to move this knight on f3 somewhere and he decides to trade on d7, well, then you've got bishop takes d7 for free. So that's a free developing move right there. Um, anywho, yeah, black does play this a4 move, um, and then immediately black recaptures on a4. I'm not sure how black's going to finish developing here. Um, I guess the computer thinks that both of these moves are pretty equal and doesn't see anything outstanding. 
Um, that's not a good look at this too. Um, yeah, he's talking about, remarking about uh, take take and then queen b3. Um, so I don't have much to add there. Really, more of my thoughts lie around end game positions that could result in some of the variations. Um, like one thing we were considering during the lecture. Um, let's see, where was it? Rook b1 takes. Oh, I'm sorry. Instead of bishop f1, we we're considering what if white takes here? I mean, this isn't tactically lost, right? Uh, pawn takes e4. Pawn takes e5. I was on board with this. I was saying that black was better here on account of rook to c4. And Zug pointed out quite correctly uh, that, well, we've got an opposite color bishop endgame. And therefore, the pawn deficit really isn't a big deal. Um, I think queen b3 is a reasonable move here. Maybe queen e2. White wants to just activate his pieces as quickly as possible. Yeah, queen b3, stockfish is cool with. Black wants to keep on the pieces so he can generate some kind of mating attack. White needs to develop everything. Um... Black plays bishop d7 again, trying to develop his pieces. He really wants to get this bishop over to f3 and the queen to h3 and just whip up some kind of checkmate. Um, it might be there. You never know. I would hope that Stockfish would warn me before we get there. Um, okay, so what was the big problem with... So we got bishop d7. What was wrong with, like... Queen takes b7. Does that drop material? So, or does black get an attack here that's meaningful? Okay, so f2 is loose. I like rook b2. Um, oh, this is better for black. Does that mean rook b2 is not the right move? What's so bad about this bishop? Oh! Okay. So that's the key here. So f2 is too loose for white to grab the pawn. Um, on account of bishop b5 coming up. Um, yeah, I'm glad to. Just be aware that this is mostly my thoughts and my reactions. And while I will make some attempt to try to answer questions, my fixation is more going to be on the end game positions. Just because that's where I fixate. Um... So, bishop f1, yeah, I think the computer pointed this out. Astana explained it pretty well. Um, however, this bishop takes e4 endgame. Um, let's see, bishop b7, or bishop d7 gets played here. And, yeah, if white plays rook to b2, instead of playing this ridiculously risky... Um, in fact, losing queen takes b7. And instead he plays the same rook b2 or rook... I don't like rook f1. Um, I'm sorry, rook b2 and rook f1 still drop the f-pawn. So... Um, I should add that here. And then white's just not better at all. So white has to play this rook b2 instead of the alternative queen takes pawn. And now that white's finally secured the f2 square and denied access um, with this uh, rook c2, um, now white is in earnest threatening to take on b7. And um, because there's no other way to defend this pawn at the moment, um, black plays bishop c6. However, ultimately this bishop does not want to stay here. Ultimately, black's going to want to find some way to shuffle and try to mate white. White's going to want to find some way to shuffle and either get a passed pawn or mate black. It's a long and confusing game ahead. Um, white doesn't have very many pawn breaks because he's already pushed most of his pawns and they're all fragmented. And most of them are on... Well, I mean, this is unfortunate for both bishops. Um, you just look at how these are all on the same color square as the bishops. Um, and you just, uh, it's really difficult to maneuver around this. It's going to be a long, long maneuvering game ahead. Um, 
And so I think that's why both Astana and the engine point out that Bishop F1 spares some of the headache that goes with all those variations. Um, just instead of trading the bishop for the knight and getting that opposite color end game, um, in which who knows where what's going to result, but probably a draw. Both players are going to do tons of shuffling, and we'll see if either one can make progress. But um, White would prefer to keep this bishop that's opposite his pawns. Um, now obviously, this is going to get fragmented a bit, but um, he does want to keep this bishop. Uh, if he were somehow able to trade the bishop on his dark squared bishop for the knight, that would be a good exchange. That would be a really beneficial exchange, but um, yeah, white doesn't really want to exchange this bishop for the knight. That doesn't help white. It does make for an interesting endgame, but it, white just doesn't get any initiative out of it. And, and all his pawns are fragmented, as they are going to be in the game anyhow. Um... So, yeah, Astana is absolutely right. Mistakes often come in pairs. It's rare for a player to make one mistake and not follow it with another mistake. And this applies for pretty much any kind of mistake, be it a blunder, be it like some tactical blunder, be it some kind of positional inaccuracy, anything in between. Um, just if a player misses the key idea, uh, often they're going to miss the key idea on the successive move. And those could be two completely different ideas. The one could be positional, one could be tactical. Usually uh, a player who has some sort of lapse will make another lapse. Um, it's just really common if you've studied a lot of chess games and played a lot of chess games, you'll see that sort of thing all the time. And what you'll frequently see is that as a player makes a mistake, their opponent will invariably make a mistake back at some point. Uh, it's rare for only one player to be making the mistakes, and so you'll see that some player ends up getting a technically worse position, and then their opponent blunders it, and then they're able to win from that after that blunder. Um, so that's why it's important to have technique and to have some sort of pedantry or be pedantic um, and make sure you understand these positions because tactics will get you somewhere, uh, positional study will get you somewhere, end game study will get you somewhere, opening study will get you somewhere, but if you're just a well-rounded player that uh, appreciates all aspects of the game, not that I am, I don't do so well in the opening, but if you appreciate both tactics and position and end game, you'll you'll get pretty far. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity for either player to blunder here, and Stan is correct to point that out. That mistakes often comes in come in pairs. He says that c5 is risky. I kind of toned out, uh, zoned out at this part of the lecture, unfortunately. I forget what it was that interrupted me, but uh, I did have some sort of interruption, so I didn't get to quite closely pay attention to this part. I see that this, um, if black gets to play c4 or d4 at some point, he probably gets a passed pawn. Um, and without the c pawn, like if he has his pawn on the b file instead of the c file, he doesn't really have that potential to create a passed pawn. Furthermore, uh, he's got a pawn duo here, which is quite strong. Um, and white's kind of bottled up in the corner, so white or black can afford to be a little bit slower in black's development. Um, if black can pull it off, it's the most positionally desired move. Um, on the grounds that the B pawn is eventually going to drop, and you have not split up this pawn duo, and you have not created an isolated B pawn. Uh, can black get away with it? Um... So yeah, the obvious threat in the position's f3. Stockfish is saying play the obvious threat right away. That, that threat is as strong as its execution. And sometimes that's the case, not always, but we'll give Stockfish the benefit of the doubt here as we start to meander along this path and see like just how far we get. That rook c4 is an interesting suggestion, I'll say. That is interesting. Now, 
I mean, it's just crazy that Rook C4 is even on the list of candidate moves in this position. The idea being that if you sack the exchange, you can take on F3 and E5 as loose, and that you just have lasting pressure. Whoa. No, are we going back to Rook C4? Seriously? Is that... No. Stockfish, you're drunk. Dude, why would you play that right away? It's always going to be possible. I mean, what's white even threatening that denies the threat of rook c4? Furthermore, what does rook c4 even accomplish? I was just commenting from the point of view that, you know, sacking the exchange isn't the worst thing in the world for black here. Um, no, what the heck? That, that's crazy. How is that the engine's preferred move? This is always a possibility. There's nothing black or white can do to even deny this possibility. There's, And yet, it's saying play the threat right away. It's like the kid who goes to the candy store and like buys all this candy and then eats it all at once even before getting uh, home. I mean, this is amazing. Um, this is, I think, using the latest and greatest stockfish, although there are going to be some updates soon. Um, now, it is playing without table bases, but this has too many uh, pieces on the board for a table base to matter. DST is absolutely right. We're going to try this out, and we're going to learn something. We're going to learn if stockfish is drunk, or if there's something worth exploring here. Now, this is not going to be very instructive at all, because you're never ever going to play rook c4 in your games but i'm just curious as a point of understanding more about end games like what's going on here how can this even be acceptable um yeah bishop b7 was what i was going to play this defends the f pawn that seems rational uh we increase pressure on f3 i can buy that that seems logical enough the B pawn's going to drop sooner or later. We don't have to capture it immediately. It's human rea uh, nature to want to take this B pawn immediately because there, that takes all the tension out of the position. But tension is what creates all this beauty and art in chess. Um, uh, Bishop c3 is possible, but not if we first play rook c4. So you think that bishop c3 is what it's trying to prevent. Um, okay. Oh! Okay, so the key idea here is that white would prefer that this pawn be defended. And therefore white wants to play bishop c3, defending the pawn. Uh, and rook c4 creates all kinds of headache for white before that um, pawn can be defended. Um, Astana did note during the lecture that you can't just take the pawn right away because a queen takes rook. And I think we all understand that. Um, and yeah, bishop c3 is a threat here. So this is a tactical means to resolve that threat. Or dissolve it, resolve it, whatever you want to solve it somehow. Um, now why bishop c to c1? What's black threatening that this would even make any sense to play? Or is the idea that you want to play e4 and then kick the knight? Um, I'm actually going to leave the rest of that analysis as an exercise for those of you interested. Uh, it's fascinating, but it's anything but instructive. Um, so, um, so my move wasn't actually going to be rook c4 here. I was more interested in bishop b7, saying, you know what, we're going to we're going to round up this pawn at our leisure. We don't have anything to worry about. We're always going to be able to take it, and this is only like 0.1 pawn different. Uh, okay, so it's yeah. I'm going to play knight f7, and we have a long and um, exciting struggle ahead. Um, yeah, we're going to play rook a3, 
This is all logical. Um, this denies black the ability to easily play d4 uh, just by tactical means. Um, White is interested in holding out to the pawn, and at the same time, he really just wants to develop his pieces. Um, I mean, if you're greedy like Stockfish is here, but you will play bishop a5. You will make some attempt to save the pawn and go through all kinds of headache to just um, get this amazing... or to have possibilities where this pawn could be uh, promoting. Um, yeah, but bishop b7 is the second best, we'll say. That Stockfish liked this almost as much as it liked rook c4. I'm giving Stockfish the benefit of the doubt that rook c4 is the best move. I'm not going to argue that. You guys can go analyze whether or not rook c4 is best. But bishop b7 is reasonable. It's strong. It creates all kinds of practical challenges for white, who might not even be winning this and probably isn't. Yeah, I like how I colored this. Uh, the thermometer that they offer is pretty nice um, as it is. I like how I colored it, just to make it stand out a little bit more. It looks beautiful. That's my opinion. Um, anywho, it looks like something you'd see out of a video game. That's kind of the a vibe I was going for there. Yeah, so Stockfish is greedy. It wants to hold on to the bee pawn. White, if he doesn't want to go through this headache and sees that the position's closed, might instead opt for b4, um, which was only plus 0.7 instead of 0.8. Um, but yeah, either way, I don't foresee this being a blowout one way or the other. There's plenty of endgame to be had for both players. Um, so what took us down this road was... Um, well, Stockfish was pointing out rook c4... Um, Astana was saying c5 is risky, but if black can pull it off, and we saw that he black is at, um, or white's at plus 0.8 or so in this variation, um, we see that black probably does have a realistic chance of pulling it off in a real game. Um, I'm actually just going to review these games, that's my agenda. Um, I don't have intent to play these games, or play... Uh, chess on this stream. Um, not this time. I just want to get through these games and there's plenty of material to look at here. Um, so we're just taking a look at c5 and seeing like is this a reasonable move? And I'm going to mark where's the interesting move marker? It's down here somewhere. Do -do -do. Interesting move. Whoops. Scroll the page back up. c5 interesting move it is risky. And yeah, black can probably pull this off against a human. And probably even against a computer, if you are a computer, um, black could probably still pull off c5. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I think that um, it's probably the most realistic winning-ish sort of attempt. Um, and yeah, certainly after black split up his pawns, black does not have winning chances. Black doesn't even have very much in the way of trying to create counterplay over here. Um, because now, in order to advance the b-pawn, it's got to go through b5. And white's going to set up some blockade on the b4 square. He's going to play a3 and put his bishop on b4. I don't know exactly how he's going to get there, but he's going to get there somehow. Or if he doesn't get there, he's going to extract some sort of concession out of uh, black in order to prevent that blockade. But once this pawn advances to b5, as it eventually will, I don't know how long it's going to take to get there, but if it does ever advance to b5, it's going to be blocking the bishop. Okay, so we accept the fact that, well, maybe that pawn's going to advance and the bishop's going to be blocked. Maybe black doesn't need that bishop to create some threats over here, but I don't know. I think calling c takes b6 a mistake is overdoing it. Um, uh, it's certainly not the most challenging reply, but I wouldn't call it a mistake. It, it's inaccurate for sure. Um, anyway, uh, is bishop d4 best? 
Yeah, Stockfish likes it. It's cool. Yeah, that's cool. So let's skip ahead a bit because this is still a really complicated position. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this got really tactical pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, we saw that black has a perpetual uh, in these lines, and white just got white dozed off at the wheel, unfortunately for white. Um, so we don't have any endgame to study. Uh, but I'd argue that I'm not going to go back and analyze these possible endgames that could have resulted if black didn't go for this crazy, um, well, okay, maybe this isn't entirely black's decision. White could have chose to make this endgame complicated too. Um, wait. Okay, yeah, I have my remark here about, like, taking b6 instantly was not necessary. Um... So I'm going to mark that as dubious, because that B pawn was always looming there, just waiting to be taken. Um, and so, I mean, even if black pushes the pawn to B5, even if he pushes it to B4, it's still a, it's a huge liability. Yes, the B pawn is black's best winning chance here, but it's, I mean, he's not going to win with that pawn. Uh, yeah, it's easy for players to doze off after the first hour or so of playing, so I can completely get it. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to be critical. I'm not going to hold back here. And when players are playing lazy moves like, oh, you know what? This pawn could cause me headaches later. I should just get rid of it right away and not even bother looking for a better move. Or maybe I'm in time pressure and don't have time to look. Or maybe I just don't understand what's going on. I don't know what the case was here. But I'm going to be critical and just assume that white didn't know. Uh, and assume that maybe some of us don't know. And assume maybe I don't know. But I would pause and think a long, long time before I take that pawn. And really give it my all to see, can I find anything, anything at all that looks reasonable? Now, I know I've got an audience here, so it's not like I'm actually playing a game. If this were me playing a game, you would see me sitting here thinking forever um, until I find some sort of plan that's going to guide me for the next five to ten moves. Um, and until I find that plan, in my own game, I'm not going to play something here. But we've got an audience to entertain. You guys don't want to sit and watch me think forever. Um, my idea was... Um, well, let's see. I actually kind of like this bishop. I don't want to exchange it. I'd rather have my opponent exchange. On the other hand, am I able to develop my pieces somehow? Um, I mean, is it necessary for me to exchange so I can gain the tempo? One thing that I do benefit from exchanging on uh, a6 is that I have this idea of capturing on b6 and e6. Actually, Astana pointed this out during his lecture. Um, I'm kind of surprised. Oh, here it is in the notes. Yeah. Yeah, this, this would have been a better way to go. Um, he did point this out. Um, and we're going to look at a bit, this a bit deeper, because this is an endgame that's worth just appreciating. Um... So candidate moves, in my mind, are queen b3, queen d1, oops, not queen from b3 to d1, but queen c2 to d1. Um, queen e2 is out because of this discovery and diagonal. Um, let's see, any other candidate moves? So this is how you play in a chess game, is you first identify, like, what are my possible ideas? And maybe if you get stuck searching for a while, maybe you go back and see, like, okay, let's go back to move one and see, did I miss anything? Um, I guess, yeah, rook takes a6 as a candidate move. Um, it actually looks really... Oh, if not for f2 being loose, rook takes queen would have been really strong here. Um, so I'm trying to balance... White's got several threats here. Obviously, once uh, these attacks on the queens are resolved, the, this is going to be loose, and this is going to be advancing pretty quickly. 
especially if accompanied by the queen, which is going to remain on this diagonal. So I think these are candidate moves. I don't think you're going to find any other candidate moves that are reasonable. Um, I don't think that queen b1 is reasonable because it makes a4 too hard to accomplish, and there's no reason to go there anyhow. So you could use a computer to analyze every one of these individually. Stockfish is showing a preference for queen d1. I'm trying to understand what's the big deal there. Like, why that? Um, obviously, black is intending uh, on his turn to go back and then try to play rook c2 and hit f2. Um, yeah, so... Now, if we just exchange the queens right away, white takes on e6. Oh, yeah, and f2 drops, and that's not... That's not worth questioning or investigating. So rook takes queen is out. Um, so that leaves our two queen moves. Um, and I guess, yeah, the queen on d1 actually is more flexible. Um, on b3, it doesn't do a especially good job defending the back rank. So yeah, our best candidate move, without searching too deeply, um, as long as you see that black is threatening to try to liquidate some pieces so that he can get his king involved and try to break this up and or use his king to maybe even take the e pawn at some point in the distant distant future as long as you see that then you see like uh, queen b3 and queen d1 are my candidate moves the queen on b3 doesn't really do a good job attacking anything and if i do manage to take e6 it's probably at the downfall of um this square here one of these so yeah the, there's a lot of reasons to play queen d1 uh obviously the queen on d1 can't do anything about h3 but it can apply some pressure on f3 so yeah i'm gonna go with the engine suggestion of queen d1 here um black does still need to defend the pawn and simultaneously create some threats against uh white's king side White does want to develop this rook, which is sitting kind of lonely in the corner. Uh, just sitting there all neglected and stuff. Oops, did not intentionally play that. Let's go back and play this to the correct square. Oh, this is how it's going to hold together. So White sees that the e-pawn is not falling anytime soon. And he changes his tune and says, let's exchange some rooks. That all looks sane. Um, Black still wants to target this pawn here. Black still would prefer to be able to target something over here. Uh, the queen is in the way of the rook. And a queen on a6 is difficult to displace without a queen exchange. And every exchange is going to bring Black's king one step closer to maybe making some difference here. Um, so yeah, Black does want to develop like so. Um, is bishop d4 really useful? What's the idea with bishop d4? I really don't see it, and I want to understand it, if there is one. Maybe the idea is just that we don't want this bishop to be loose and subject to a fork on the second rank. Um, it's hard to believe that's the whole idea. Maybe part of the idea is that if we ever do displace the queen, that we want this pawn to be able to run to a7 very quickly. Maybe part of the idea is that it denies Black's knight access to c5. Um, regardless, I don't know that I'm buying that. I guess there's no other way to develop this bishop, though, because it can't go through a3 without drop... Or, it uh, probably cannot go through a3. I'm not saying for certain, but probably not. And so, yeah, this is really the safest way to develop the bishop. Um, I'll leave bishop a3 in various um, in-between moves and then bishop a3 is exercises for you guys to figure out if you are so inclined. Um, I really don't like pushing the pawn if we have anything better to do, but on the other hand e6 is secure and black's pawns are pretty safely put together. Um, so this pawn duo can repel pretty much any one piece by itself that white sends over here. 
um, they do cover, in fact, I shouldn't highlight them this way, I should uh, highlight that they cover these squares really soundly. Um, so that makes it difficult for white to try to conjure any attack, especially in light of the fact that this pawn is on the same color square as the bishop. So this is not going to be easy for white. And that's why the engine's suggesting a5, even though I don't see how that leads to any concrete uh, development. Um, yeah, it's, there's going to be a ton of maneuvering before we see anything happen here. Um, that's interesting. Both g5 and h6 are candidate moves here. G5, I was initially skeptical about, and then I thought, well, if I don't play G5 now, when am I going to get to play it? On the other hand, um, I think there's white can't do anything to deny G5. For example, if white plays F4, uh, the second rank is wide open, perpetual ideas. And if um, white plays H4 to try to deny G5, um, white's created some weaknesses. Um, or white's weak in g3 ever so slightly. And so that if any kind of sack or exchange happens on d4 and the third rank opens up, then g3 is loose. So black's willing to risk that and delay g5 by a move, which seems quite reasonable in light of the fact that white's also got this queen h5 idea to try to complicate black's life. Um, Plus, a pawn on g5 gets in the way of the knight, should white even end up playing f3. Um, I mean, we could take a look briefly and digress here. I was not sure whether white wanted to play queen h5 or f3. Um, Stockfish likes f3. I'm kind of liking not that, not that. I'm kind of liking queen h5. Um, Wait, so it's saying plus 1.6. Stockfish's preferred move, it's saying plus 1.4. So it likes my move just as much, if not better. Uh, it actually likes both of these. They're both fine. Um, it probably is just some sort of move ordering inversion thing. Oh. Oh, wow. That's a profound concept, saying, like, my pawn's defended, you can't take it, neener, neener. Um, that's profound, man. Okay. What in the world is going on that rook c2 is best? This is sharp. I admit I did not see all of this. Um. Wait. Is this really the best way to go about this? If rook c2... Oh, the knight protects g5, so I don't have any mating ideas. So I do end up having to place my rook on f1. So this is why back here, um, this covers the c2 square. Um, so that's why we don't play queen h5 immediately. That's interesting. Uh, Amazing Lord does really well analyzing games that he's prepared to analyze. Um, I don't want to catch him on the spot. <laughs> he does offer really good pragmatic advice too, and he's exceptional at analyzing things, but um, I'm sure he would be a great help in these sorts of positions, but I'm sure with some time I could come up with uh, many, or Stockfish and I could come up with many ideas that he comes up with. Um, so yeah, we want to deflect this knight. Black takes, we take back. We're still plus 1.7. Um, did I want to exchange queens prior to this? I think I'm due. So if I exchange rook takes, pawn takes, do I not have an obvious king 8 to b5 idea? I mean, what's going to offset this? Stockfish. I mean, I get that there's a thing called the horizon effect, but seriously? 
like I see king f2, king e3, king d3, king c3, king b4. And in the meantime, black's king, let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five squares away. Let me see this. Am I just seriously missing this? Or. Okay, so I miscounted it. Uh, it's more far, more distant than I thought. I was hoping white's king would be on b4. Um, so now I see where this is coming from. So we play h4 to try to break this up. Oh. Okay, so now, yeah, f4 is forced. Note that if f4 did not happen here, um, this would be problematic. But once we have f4, black controls um, this. So it's a long road for white's king. And it takes white as much time to take this f pawn as it does for black to take the d pawn. So I'm forced to back up a bit and say, you know, I can't play king d3 here. Um, on the other hand, am I going to try to zugzwang black, or what? what is it that Stockfish likes about this, the h3 here? Um, no, I really don't like this pawn takes pawn. Um, oh, on the other hand, it's kind of forced. Wow. Okay, so we take, king takes. This is probably why earlier and now Stockfish is recommending h6, but it's no good. These pawns do break through, etc., etc. Um, really? Oh, okay, okay, I get it. That's surprising. But yeah, here the key idea is that if black trades on the queen side, white pushes g5. Black is forced to exchange on g5, and white ends up taking e6 before d4 drops, because white's king is too close, and the white promotes first and then wins the pawn endgame. Um, yeah, so the king breaks through by force. Um, so back here, Stockfish is saying, play h6, delay some of this. Um, well, it's not black's move, but... Yeah, instead of c6, uh, I think it did recommend at one point h6, but I think this amounts to the same thing. Oh, I'm sorry, no, here it's not the same thing. Here I, I've played king d3. King d3 is a mistake. It gives away the win. It's a mistake, not a good move. Okay. Um, but yeah, white can force through. So what this all means is that when Stockfish was saying just take on d4 and that taking on d4 is best well okay if you're an engine maybe that's true if you're a human just trade the queens because this is a forced win yeah it's a principle of two weaknesses black can't simultaneously mop up this pawn and deal with whatever weaknesses he's created on the king's side uh, note if the pawn were back on g7 this would be a whole lot more difficult for white's king to break through um, because these pawns on g7 and h7 would guard f6, g6, h6. So what this all means is that this whole g5 idea, while interesting, is not the best move. Um, or at least it gives uh, white a comfortable endgame. Um, and so he needs to play something... I mean, okay, yeah, even h6 and g6, if later forced to play that, would be interesting. Um, but white's eventually going to get some good endgame play out of this against most humans. Uh, I think we understand uh, the key idea that white's king can break through. That's the key idea. Um, and we can talk about the specifics of, well, what about this variation, what about that variation, but the key idea is there that you have the principle of two weaknesses that black has to deal with his weakness dealing with this uh, advanced pawn just one threat and the other weakness is just whatever white can conjure up over here on the king side unless black plays it perfectly and does create no weakness whatsoever which is kind of unlikely um or maybe that's to say that if you play g5 that knight takes d4 leads to a lost endgame 
and therefore this knight maneuvering in this direction uh, just doesn't work out. Um, and that rook a2 forces an exchange of too many pieces and black just doesn't have practical chances. That perhaps um, instead of playing the knight to e2, maybe black's forced to try to play the knight to a6 and then try to save the position somehow. It's not easy. Um, but yeah, white has tons of practical chances. Um, okay. Uh, Karma Gobert says that this looks equal. Um, after we take on d4 and do a queen exchange. I I mean, you think rook and pawn in games, you think this looks equal. But this... White's got a pawn on the fifth rank. Uh, white covers this square here. White covers this square. And so black's only inlet to deal with this a pawn would be to play his king over to c6 and b5. Um, so we play king f7, king f2, king e7, king e3. Actually, maybe king e7 might be wrong. Um, but I'm sure there's tempo moves that white can play here. I just don't see a way that black can hold this. Um, but yeah, after this position, we'll just assume that both sides played accurately to here. I can't prove that, but I'm going to assume that black has not goofed up in the last few moves. Um, I'm going to assume that black has to make a decision. Does he stay in the, on the center file, as Stockfish recommends? Uh, does he go to the queen side or does he go king side? Um, thankfully for black, he does control c4 as white controls c5, so it's not so easy for white to break through on the queen side. That's not a trivial task at all. Um, but if white manages to locate his king on a4, then it's going to keep one of these two black pieces busy. Um, let's take a look at some of this. Uh, okay, I get that h3 is a tempo move. Um, you're just slowly pushing on the king side. Um, I'm curious if g4. Yeah, okay, black's gonna get zugzwanged here. Um, oh! It's even worse than that. It's not black simply dropping the f pawn. It's that um, also. Well, yeah. Okay. So this. How's this go? I think that the white rook covers all these back squares and could always drop back to a one if he needed to. Um, so what I thought was most interesting here. Oh well, that's cute. That is really cute, Stockfish. That was completely unnecessary, and yet you did it anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so the key point is that black is in Zug. It's the Zug that just keeps giving. Um, so, h6 trying to deflect the king. I was going to say, white's probably winning that anyway. Um, but yeah, the line that Stockfish gave was just concrete winning. I'm not entirely sure about what if um, white doesn't play king f4. This might be dangerous. This is what I was thinking about. I was actually thinking pawn takes pawn. Um, and yeah, so we're in check. We gotta move the king. Uh, our king is not going to successfully stop the pawns. So we should try to activate the king instead. Um, Black wants to keep his king as close to this action as possible so White's pawn doesn't run and create problems for this rook, so he's going to push. White's going to threaten to push e6. Black checks. Black checks again, or not. Yeah, repeatedly checking is not going to do any good because White just takes the deep pawn. Uh, so Black's going to attempt to not get zugged. White's going to zug him. And now Black has to move. Um, oh. Another clever tempo move. Um, I'm not sure if this is necessary, but it probably is. 
Yeah, in fact, it is. So this is necessary to win it. Um, and is Brook A1 necessary? Can I do other temporizing things? The key point is, well, I'm not sure I get the key point. If we play Rook A1, he's just going to play G2. And this, this is suddenly not looking so winning. Um, I'm going to go with that suggestion, but I don't think that that changes the situation. Um, so we take here, and then we push the E pawn. Right, and this drops. So we push here. Check. Um, we don't want to get in the way of our pawn. Okay, and this is a draw. So what this all goes to show is that this cute king move, king f4, just waiting to run black out of tempi is actually necessary. That king takes h6 throws the win away. Um, for not obvious reasons. Um, so yeah, king f4 is necessary to win this. Uh, but yeah, back here I was just saying the general idea is that there's all this zugzwang potential after f5. And that does get realized in the main variation. Um, then Stockfish is seeing that, okay, f5 wins and that's great and all, but king d3 looks a whole lot easier, it's saying. I don't believe that. I think that's probably nonsense. Um, oh, wait. So here's the concept of the square of the pawn. Oops. The square of the pawn is a square. This is a square. So you see the square, right? And the idea is that this pawn on uh, e5 is going to run if an exchange occurs. Um, just to illustrate that, we move here, um, yeah, black tries to forestall the inevitable, we go here, black tries to stop us, we go here, eventually black's going to get zugged here one way or another, so, um, he goes this way, and so now we've moved, we're able to move the rook because we've protected this pawn, and so we're threatening rook takes h6, but why not throw this check in first, just to make things easier for us? And so now, if the king goes back to b7, um, I don't know. I mean, the whole idea is that we've got tons of potential to go every which way in this position. We've defended the pawn, and black is forced to give up his fortress, which wasn't really a fortress in the first place. Um, so that's what Stockfish is saying is, you know, that's great and all that f5 wins, but it thinks that king d3 is even more winning. Who am I to argue with the engine? Who am I to argue? Okay, so all that goes to show that if you play g5 and after having played g5 you exchange on d4, um, this is just lost for black. And that makes me wonder whether g5, okay the engine's got opinions about this, it thinks that this is better for white. I don't know whether it's winning by force. Uh, you guys can figure that out on your own time. Um, but surely it offers a lot of possibilities uh, for white. And if the spawn were just back on g7, um, white wouldn't be able to break through as easily. On the other hand, uh, it's really hard to sit and wait for the inevitable. Um, and Stockfish doesn't like sitting and waiting. It, it much prefers, let's find some tactical possibility and try to confuse the opponent. Or let's find some possibility and see, like, what's the best we can make of this? Um, and, you know, maybe that's the right attitude here. Maybe Black's lost anyhow, and so he wants to go down with the fight. Um, it's a difficult endgame. But we've explored a lot. We've learned some key ideas there. Um, so... This all goes to show, uh, yeah, white probably didn't have time to look at all of that. But it would have been good if white could at least identify this key idea of let's exchange the bishops. 
such that we have the tempo to take on b6 and get into a favorable end game. Um, um, I don't like bishop takes b6 at all just because that blocks the rook and um, I mean part of the reason he obviously analyzed with this com with the computer he saw the evaluation drop I have to be somewhat honest that part of the reason I don't like it is because of the evaluation drop which just kind of justifies in my mind the fact that I much prefer to have the rook here than have the bishop there um, but this would take a lot of analysis to show that bishop takes b6 actually um, justifies this kind of drop in the winning chances. Um, but it just feels right in a sense. It just, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, it just seems like white's chances are so much better if he can get his rook off the back rank and somewhere useful. Usually when you have your rook on an open file, but it's on a semi-open file that's the next best thing um but yeah white would rather have his rooks doubled on the seventh than have them doubled on the first here um but i get that there's all kinds of pressure he has to deal with too i really at first i hesitated to exchange the bishops because this is white's best piece but these pawns in the center are really hard to break apart and so the fact that he's got this bishop and it's opposite the color of his pawns does a great job or a great service to defend his king, but it doesn't do so much of a service in attacking because black doesn't have too many weaknesses. Um, and so really black's two weaknesses are one, just the fact that he's got some of his pawns advanced further than his other pawns, and two, the fact that white's going to have this passed pawn if this ex if white ends up taking the b pawn and white would have to identify some other kind of weakness in order to justify not going into this concrete variation um, instead he decided to go this way um, and so we saw queen d2 in the game which yeah astana correctly points out this is the correct move it's the only move it does uh offer up the rook um and he's done plenty of analysis with the computer and figured out that, okay, rook b2 would have been the safer and wiser choice here, not letting your king um, get barbecued, uh, or at least not allowing the perpetual check. And okay, yeah, I buy that. And I'm sure he's done tons of analysis here. And this is all very tactical and not very endgame oriented. Um, lots of fireworks are going to result here and there's really not much I can apply in general endgame concepts to a position with so many pieces on the board um, and so what I have to do here is just you know say Stana's done a great job analyzing that there's just too much here it's too rich it's I can't break this down into fundamental pieces here um, so the rest of the game is just tactics and there's really not much I can offer in the way of general advice when tactics decide the game one way or the other um, other than just calculate the tactics right but you already know that you have to do that so we explored some end games here um, I'm gonna move on to the board three game uh, a battle of transpositions Again, opening theory is not exactly my forte, um, and he did cover this quite well, so I don't really have much to add to Astana's commentary on the opening. Um, I did throw around some other ideas here, but yeah, he covered this very rigorously. Um, and just one general concept I'll point out is that, well, two, um, one, Black's White's king is quite exposed, and White would prefer to have castled by now just to get out of this mess. And two, that developing knights before bishops can be quite useful. And it's not as if this bishop was going to take out the d5 pawn in the opening. It might create some threats that force Black to respond to those threats, but having this knight out before the bishop might have been useful here, because a knight on d4 could very well cover this square. Um, 
And so there's reasons for knights before bishops. And if I actually scroll back to where did that knight get developed, the other knight, I guess that was move two. It's a hard to fault white on move two. Um, you know, we get got caught in the crossfire and some transpositions here. Um, but yeah, there's reasons. Um, well, okay, yeah, this bishop on g2 looks dramatic, but it's just firing at this pawn. And black's going to get to play d5 anyway, and white has failed to stop d5. I mean, it, it feels like this is going to stop d5, but it really didn't. And we saw this in the game. That just tactically, bishop g2 didn't stop anything. And therefore, white should actually try to fart. He's already got the e4 square. He's going to get a bishop attacking d5. It's not like he's giving up on the light square, so he should try to fight both for light and dark, rather than just entirely focusing his attack, as he did, um, on the light squares. Because white's got these two, he's got this one, and that's it. And contrast that with black, who's got some pressure here. Oh, well, I can't nest circles anymore, but... Um, you get the idea that black's covering both light and dark squares in his development. And white's overprotecting some light squares and forgetting about the other squares. And that leaves him with a shortage of ways to move his pieces. Um, yeah, black is immediately threatening d4, so white has to play d4 right away. And he has to take back with the queen, and this has gained a tempo for black. And this has gained another tempo for black. And okay, yeah, I don't have much else to say in general remarks. I was pretty surprised that white gave the exchange. Maybe there's a lot to figure out in the opening. Again, openings aren't my strong suit, so we'll leave it at that there. Um, yeah, so here, uh, I know that there was some analysis done regarding king, uh, king e2 and king g1. Really what I expected here was knight d4. And then similar to the previous game, there's this idea of just advancing all the pawns at once together and just playing f3 and h4. And I mean, it's not perfect. Um, White's still under a lot of pressure. White's going to allow what's technically a bad bishop for technically a good bishop trade. Um, but I think this is the way to go. Is there some tactical reason that this is out of the question? Um, okay. Wait, why are we not just playing bishop e5 here? Okay, why are we not just playing f4 here? Why are we not just playing f4 in this position? Um, I don't see it. Oh, the bishop's getting trapped. Okay, so that's what he failed to point out, is that white's bishop gets trapped in this variation. So I didn't understand that. Oops, somehow I scrolled into the wrong variation. That's okay. Um, so white played knight e5, and I mean, white's development is quite lacking here anyway. Um, so yeah, apparently he can't move this piece yet. Um, yeah, I'll just trust that Astana was correct with his middle game analysis of king e2 and king g1. Um, just trust him on that. I don't need to question his ability to calculate. Um, okay. Yeah, we never really got to an endgame in this one, did we? That's a pity. All right, let's move on to the next game. Uh, this is board two, select a game. So let's take a look. Uh, I'll leave the opening theory to the theoreticians. It could be fun to explore some openings in detail, but um, okay, yeah, white's got an interesting positional bind here. Um, and wait. What went on here? Uh, wait, how did we get here? Oh, right. 
No, I remember. Um, hang on. My mouse likes to double click a lot. So if I click two moves at once, that's probably why. Um, Astana likes this bishop a5. I guess it forces uh, queen c5. And if queen c5 weren't forced, I wouldn't like it so much. I was actually thinking queen b8, but, you know, we'll assume that this is forced. And then Astana correctly points out that c3 is the way to go here, intending to just... Um, if black castles, as he pointed out during the lecture, that this simply wins an exchange. And this is good. Uh, but I'm here to analyze some endgames, so let's get on to that part. Um, yeah, perhaps what was just struggling looking for a plan, I don't know. Um, so we got this position. H. Ooh. <laughs> Black said, no need to rush. Now, I'm sure Black was, like, smelling victory here. Um, let's see. Let's use this kind of color arrow, just to say we got some Black threatening stuff. Um, I'm sure Black was thinking, man, this looks awesome, and if I can make that work, it would be fantastic. And maybe he was... I don't know, we're on move 26. I can't comment on the time situation because I don't know it. Um, but I guess, you know, history tends to be written by the victors. And so it's really easy for me to crap all over um, Black for miscalculating this. Um, um, I don't know. Stana's saying, you know, A5 might have been the way to go. I don't know how you managed to figure that out. A5 looks good on general grounds, that that's putting another pawn on a dark square. It's putting your pawns connected, defending each other, and giving your bishop a little bit of extra maneuvering room if it ever has to go to b7 to a6. Um, it's kind of a good waiting move, because you're not entirely sure if you want to commit to pushing this pawn. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, if you're pushing the h-pawn, uh, some practical chances might arise. Um, so, we got the queen exchange. Do I want to go into, like, what happens if we don't exchange queens? Wait. Am I missing something here? Am I missing a tactic? Is queen f6 crushing? How... If it is crushing, how is it that that got missed in the commentary? There's no way that it's crushing, because if it were crushing, we would have said something about it during the lecture. Um. Okay, Stockfish, tell me, what's up? How's it hanging? Oh, it's not White's move. That's the deal. Yeah, I thought it was White's move here. Yeah, so white's forcing a queen trade. Should white be forcing it? Um, well, in light of all that pressure, maybe. Um, so we're going to ask Stockfish one more time. Give us an idea. Give us a move. Um, yeah, that is an important detail. Um, when you're analyzing a tactical position, make sure you're making the moves on the correct player's turns. So yeah, Stockfish is not claiming to see anything crazy here that just wildly changes this from a black being better to white being better. Um, black is better developed as the result of his opening and early middle game play. And so yeah, white's feeling the heat. As much as I wish that there were some magic resource that just turned this all around somehow, because that d6 pawn does look menacing. Um, I don't really think there is such a resource here. I wish that you could just like play queen e1, rook fd2, and then if black ever plays bishop d5, you just sack a rook and sack as many pieces as you have to on d5. Actually, you have bishop takes d5. So that's not really hanging. Um, 
regardless, yeah, black wants to play like f6, king f7, and double the rooks and just mate you. And black's attacking chances are greater. And if there were some hidden resource, Stockfish probably would have found it. Um, so we're going to try trading down. And this is where um, black played that bishop takes g2, was, which was not very pragmatic. Uh, a5, keeping things safe. But why a5? What's to say, like, why don't we just play, like, rook b8? It's an alternative. There's tons of moves to consider here. Actually, there's just two. Um, there's a5 and rook b8. And if you've got tons of time on the clock, okay, sure, look at the sack. But, um, or if you're in some crazy position where I guess you just really trust your ability to calculate, Okay, sack a piece in time pressure. Most players are not comfortable doing that, um, but that's where your comfort zone is, and sometimes it works. Maybe that's the right way to go. Um, yeah, so we take on b2. Bishop c4. I'm still seeing, like, it's... Is there an obvious mistake here somewhere by either player? Um, apparently bishop c4 does not swing the evaluation and it looks like the most sensible move in the position. Um, in fact, yeah, if you play rook c4 trying to go for mate and do cheeky things with the d-pawn, that traps the bishop. So bishop c4 is really the only way to go here. Um, I want to find an alternative to a5. I want to say that somehow black has some amazing resource that just instantaneously converts this position. But there's not such a thing, or, um, or at least we're all missing it. What happens after h4? Wait, so we're minus 0.5 after h4 and minus 0.9 before it. So this hasn't really, this hasn't made any huge swing to the evaluation. Um, okay, now white's better here for some reason. Um, oh, because I can't play rook a2 like I was intending. Okay, so h4 is just uh, misguided. So we're going to mark that as dubious. That maybe at some future point h4 might make sense, but... Um, Stockfish recommends a5. It's hard to argue against that because if you move your king that, if you move your king to d8, um, white plays bishop a6 and rook c4, or at least threatens to. That's really tricky to deal with. Um, so I just don't want to rule that a5 is the only move here, but maybe it is. Um, Black hasn't decided whether or not to play f6 and king f7 and stuff. In fact, playing f6 and sacking the pawn for a tempo um, is not productive because then white goes back to c4 and you can't play e5 and king f7, king e6. Or playing f6 and then king f7, intending to play e5 and king e6, still not a productive venture. So yeah, a5 for, um, maintaining the pawn is the best way to go. Simple and obvious, but it also means that there's no digression for us to make there. Um, rook c2 also seems simple and obvious. I'm pausing just to look for a second, but nope, that's definitely the way to go. Uh, rook c4 is. Um, let's see, did rook c4 throw the game? Yeah, we didn't really explore this variation. And I do want to explore it. So rook c4, looking, does this throw the game or not? What would the, or black would like to get the pawns in a3 and b2. Um, and playing b3 does bring black closer to that goal. He'd also like to play f6 and e5 if he can find the time to do it. Um, why not f6 right away? Why is it recommending b3? 
I suppose if we don't play b3, then white plays bishop b5, and we have a tough decision to make. But why didn't white play bishop b5 on the outset? Um, is this bad? Is there some tactical nuance that I'm missing here? Wait, what was that? Minus 2. Oh no, no, we went back to minus 0. 0.6. So yeah, bishop b5 would have been a really clever... Well, I don't know if it's clever, but... At first, uh, Stockfish is recommending king f3 and saying that this is really good for black. Um, and even here, it persists in recommending king f3 even after we've played bishop b5 and it said, oh, you know what, this is actually better. But afterward we go back and it says, you know, I still like king f3. It's hard to argue some sense into this computer sometimes. Um, I'm sure given enough time and resources, it would recognize that bishop b5 is actually the way to go here. I'm not sure why it's so confused about this endgame. But yeah, bishop b5 seems like the way to go. Um, on the other hand, this does potentially allow just sacking the a pawn and we play b3, b2. And maybe there's some trick whereby that actually is profitable. I would be surprised. Um, so in any event, yeah, play bishop b5 first. Uh, then play e5, keeping the white king out of the center. And white's going to shuffle because he's got a bishop. Yeah. Stockfish is awesome at calculating. And not so awesome at the whole learning thing. Um, oh. Wait. Wait, what? Oh, what say you, Stockfish? What are you trying to tell me? So I understand that Black's king cannot break through on the king's side. I get that. Um, I'm still confused why it would prefer h4 instead of king d8. That seems really illogical to me. I don't understand that. I mean, yeah, if playing h4 forced white to play h3, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. So if we play h4, um, white can't himself play h4. And so we can't uh, fix this pawn on a light square. On a light square, it would be a long-term weakness. And so playing h4 gives black the opportunity to later play king d8. Now, he could probably invert the move order without any consequence, right? Right? Okay, yeah, Stockfish is agreeing with me that so far I haven't blown it. Um, still haven't blown it. Okay, now it's suggesting chuck a pawn, because we want to get our king active. Um, but yeah, this is drawing, apparently. Well, no, white doesn't want to play king g3. That king on g3 would be misplaced, I think. We could take a look. Uh, so king d8, king g3, king c8. Uh, I guess let's just continue logically, right? Um, well, okay, you're probably presupposing not that we're going to play uh, king h4 probably presupposing that we're going to play just pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and then move the king to h4. Because, uh, you know, black is eventually threatening to play king c5 here. So I'm not sure why you'd want to put the king on g3. I'm missing something. Um, one could even argue... Okay, so the bishop on d5 is stopping king b7 at the moment. Um, so you could argue that... I mean, if you were to give black a move somehow, if this were somehow still black's turn, he could probably get away with pawn h4. 
Um, because the triple pawns actually block off the king from attacking any of them. And by the time the king attacks one of them, um, Blackcliff created some threat elsewhere on the board. And Black just has tons of pawns. Okay. Yeah, so king g3 is kind of out. Um, White wants to try to deal with these threats in the center. And, you know, black is still interested in playing the king over to the queen side and stuff. I still find it funny. Stockfish says that this is minus 1.1. I don't believe that. I think that Stockfish would have learned from this. I don't know what's going on here anymore. Um, but I've got to believe that Stockfish is trying to analyze this and somehow failing. Um, there's, I mean, you can't drop from uh, a win or a potential win like minus 1.1 to zero and then go back and not have figured that out. I must have somehow accidentally interrupted it and it's just stuck. Um, I don't know. What if I try to reboot it? No. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, my idea was, though, to try to bring the king out and harass the d-pawn. Um, Stockfish's original idea was to play h4, such that this pawn is not fixated, or cannot be fixed on a light square. Uh, White wants to bring the king over to the queen side. Okay, yeah, I guess there's actually not a whole lot to analyze here. Um, if White's bishop were not able to harass this deep one way back here, um, if that weren't potentially an option, uh, then White would just be able to play the king to b3 and just claim a draw with some sort of fortress because the black's king moves too far. Well, one, White can play h3, and two, um, White can even play bishop e6 and pawn takes and then advance the d-pawn. So, yeah, apparently that's a draw with best play if black tries to advance in the center really quickly. But, supposing he doesn't try to do the obvious advance right away, is there still any possibility here? So, I kept thinking, what if I can try to break like this? It's not getting very far. Um, so we got bishop c4 stopping the pawns in their tracks, king d8, yeah, so king here, oh, now we're too slow in a sense to, yeah, can we take this, and then we play e5, um, I was going to say this is too slow, that black doesn't have winning chances here. Um, but maybe he's got something. Maybe it's not absolutely nothing. Wait, why is that better than king g5? What the heck? Why is king g5 not best? It looks really obvious. And yet, if black plays f4, we want to play king g4 get that you want to keep your options open, but that's, you're really stretching the limits of the imagination here. Um, I mean, why not h4? How is h4 worse than bishop f7? Are they equivalent, or is this actually terrible? Holy moly, wow. Uh, apparently, h4 throws the game. Bishop f7 is okay, though. It's probably any bishop move that temporizes is fine. Um, because we need this king move? What? What is this? Okay, yeah, we have to keep up with the pawn. We can't just play king g5 because the pawn runs. Um, okay. So now we're going to go after the pawns? So, why bishop f7? Why not just the simple thing? 
Why do we have to make life difficult for ourselves, Stockfish? I know you like showing off your calculating ability, but seriously? Um, okay. Oh. Oh, okay. So you've made a case. Stockfish has made a case that there might be some benefit to playing bishop f7 that might not be realized if you instead play king g5. Um, uh, okay, we defend the pawn. Still, what's black going to even threaten here? Yeah, as long as white's got these squares covered, um, there's no win. That still makes me wonder, though, why black went this way instead of playing f4. Um, did it just not see f4? Okay, we saw that h4 loses. Um, but what was wrong with this? And then we go back, and white pushes the h-pawn. And so I guess we see that white has a different kind of resource in this position. Uh, can I not play... Oh, king f6 does not actually threaten to go after the d-pawn. So this is more along the lines of what I was thinking. That um, white's got a fortress because the bishop can shuffle, shuffle back and forth. But I suppose the point of playing e4 is to keep the white king away from the h-pawn by an additional file. Yeah, you're exactly right, Ocelot. That's exactly it. Um, that f4 is not the strongest challenge to king g5. That, in fact, the strongest challenge against king g5 is e4. Uh, so I'm going to mark that as the interesting move in this position. Um... Darn it, I scrolled the wrong way. That's my bad. Yeah, e4 is the most interesting way to go because it forces the king away from the h file and therefore forces white into more passive position. But white's got everything covered. Um, uh, note that the king is never threatening to actually take f5 because then the e pawn would run and then the a pawn would promote. So. Um, the important considerations here are just defending all the important squares, um, which is most easily done by bishop f7, which is just brilliant. And nobody's going to find that in a real game, but it's brilliant nonetheless. So we got king f4, king e8, bishop b3, king f8, just getting the king forward, king g7 g6. Um, so we've determined that black cannot break through in the center. And what happens if we try to go this way? We haven't looked at this yet. White checks. Okay, what happens if we try to go this way? Oh, right. Oops. Apparently this isn't totally lost. Um, this is just difficult. Actually, <laughs> Stockfish prefers black. Okay. That's kind of scary. Um, so we push. White takes. Keep going. Wait, why are we not playing bishop e6 again? What? What's going on, Stockfish? I mean, if you just play the bishop there, I'm going to take your h-pawn, then I'm going to play king g2, then I'm going to play king f2, and then I'm going to win. Um, bishop f7 is just giving up. I don't know why it prefers that move to, say, just bishop e6, and white tries to promote. Um, this must mate faster or something stupid like that. Um, so, get a queen, get a queen. Importantly, this is covered. Um, so this is why Stockfish didn't want to go here. 
Uh, so I've succeeded in tricking the engine again. Yeah, there's no checks. So that's why it didn't want to sack the bishop. Instead, it wanted to um, play bishop f7. Can I click on that, please? Um, so we're going to play bishop f7. Black's going to take here. And we're going to go there, because that's what the engine says to do. And we're going to do the engine's move again. Um, and so why that move? I don't get it. Oh, okay, so we can't... Oh, never mind, I was correct. Um, I was very much correct. So yeah, just check, push. No, you can't do that, Stockfish. Though that's just fatalism right there. It's grade A fatalism. You can't do that. But I guess the black pawn runs is the point. Um, so yeah, F4 just wins on the spot. You know when they say don't trust um, what the engine tells you? Um, or just don't put the blind trust in the engine. Um, yeah, that, this kind of underscores that point. Um, now, given enough time and enough memory and enough CPU power, um, and sure, I'm sure it can do a better job than most of us. Um, but yeah, the horizon effect is huge in computer chess um, analysis, and uh, it's just has been for it's been a huge problem for decades in chess, and that's why they invented table bases. And unfortunately, the way this is deployed at the moment, Stockfish does not have access to a table base, um, and so it's kind of struggling to calculate all this, just as I am struggling. Um, so there's going to be a lot to explore here. But so my point was that I was unsure over whether king h5 won or not. Um, apparently king h5 is just crushing. And there's nothing white can do to stop it. Um, okay, so you're saying bishop e6 only move. I'm not sure where you're saying that white's able to save this. Um... Wait, so, yeah, here bishop e6 lost, but you're saying maybe earlier it's good. Yeah, here initially I was thinking, just blindly following the engine's numbers, and still questioning it, trying to figure out, well, what does it mean? But I figured that this bishop e6 thing was crushing, and it just isn't. Um... So, okay, this is like unpeeling an onion. Um, we're learning things one at a time here. So I don't think bishop e6 at any point saves this endgame. Um, what might save it? I mean, yeah, I don't even know how you communicate to me if I'm missing something, but because um, this analysis tree is just an enormous forest you can't see, um, uh, well, anything, really. It's that saying about you can't see the forest through the trees. Um, it's, it's the mess. Okay, so what this all goes to show, I think, is that um, Black's attempt to move the king over to the queen side isn't the right way to go. Therefore... Um, for black to win this, he's got to make some threats in the center, kind of like what I was originally suggesting, by the way. Um, I still think the insertion of this bishop b5, bishop c4 is really useful, because otherwise the pawns make it to a3 and b2, which is just harder to deal with. So that's a really simple change. Um... And so this whole time I've been thinking, like, try to break with the king in the center, try to break with the king on the queen side. 
Um, what offers the greatest chances here, apparently, is trying to break on the king side. But wait, how did that king make it through on the king side in that other line? Um, so we saw in lines where the white king ended up taking black's h pawn that black has a avenue for his king to invade. Um, so yeah, black's inevitably going to play. Um, e5. I don't know if he has to play it right away. It might be best to delay that a little bit and get in king f7 to king g6 first. Um, we haven't looked at that yet, so we're going to look at that. King there, king there. Okay, and now it's suggesting just play h4. Which, if h4 were that important, why not play it earlier? Um, I think that's the point, is that this is not going to open up. Um, so I think that's the way that it's going to deny black any access to the king side. If black didn't have this h-pawn, this would be a different situation. Um, so we're actually going to go back to the engine suggestion here, which is e5. It likes bishop d5. I like h4. It might not matter. I'm going to throw in h4. Just another variation. Um, okay, so now black is moving his king queen side uh, direction. We play bishop d5 as we always do. And king here. Amazingly, bishop e6 does not do anything substantive. Um, I'm not sure I understand why not. So... Oh! Okay. So the point isn't that we're going to take the bishop, it's that we're going to get tripled past pawns. And that this is just too much for white to deal with. Um, okay, and sure, white can stop this pawn. Oh, this is the key, guys. This is the key to that. The key is that, um, so we're gaining a tempo. In a sense, shouldering like you'll see in so many positions. Um, so white needs to defend this, um, and white wants to push this. Um, but if he pushes d7, we take the bishop and promote, and the king eventually escapes all the checks. So backing up, what this means, obviously, um, I was going to say obviously white takes at some point, but that's not so obvious. Um, so what this all goes to show is that white would rather not play h4 and dawdle because um, he might not have time to do that. He does still have to deny black this idea of um, advancing the king to c8 to b7 to c6 and just snapping the pawn. So bishop d5 is necessary um, and that it prolongs black's route around to hit this pawn and makes that just ever so slightly more challenging for black. Um, wait, did I play h5 at some point? Or was this on h5 to begin with? Does anybody remember? Okay, this was always on h5, so that's not my fault. I did not squander a useful tempo on h5. Um, so yeah, we're going to go queenside. And we're just going to keep advancing toward the pawns. Stockfish claims that this is drawn. However, we have looked at so many endgames by now that we start to get a sense of skepticism going here, right? Uh, it's good to have a healthy sense of skepticism. Um, I don't know whether I should play e4 or whether I should take on f4. Um, 
I don't think I have to make that decision just yet. I think I can play this first. And so we play that. And if it's a saying that I should take on... Hmm. Yeah, no, this gives me the most passed pawns, even though they are tripled. Um, and so now white wants to play h4, zigzwanging black, apparently. Um, he doesn't want to move his bishop. I'm not sure why he's avoiding king b3. King b3 seems like a sensible, constructive move here. Um, yeah, no, king b3 is a sensible, constructive move. Uh, king takes a3 is forced. Okay. What? You can't be serious. How are you serious about taking that? What the doozy? Um, is the tempo so vital that you must give up the h-pawn? Or are you just allured by the possibility of taking the d-pawn? I don't know. Um, oh, okay. So there's no path, there's no entrance for the black king here. And so taking immediately um, creates the best chance for black to get his king into the position. However, he's got to deal with this h-pawn. Um, okay, how do you evaluate this? Can I just say what an awesome endgame position this is? Yeah, black has tripled past pawns, and he's got four isolated pawns. White has a wrong colored bishop, or a rook pawn, with the bishop. Um, Stockfish says this is drawn. Uh, I don't know how to evaluate this. Obviously, white can't win it. It would take some kind of miracle for white to win this. Um, I mean, stranger things have happened, but it really seems like white can't win this. Yeah, um, so I'm still struggling with this idea of F3 and then trying to push all the pawns and hoping that one promotes fast enough. Or king e4, white has to make some move, and then you push f3 and trade off, and then you push your other pawns. But I think white's too fast. Um, so white's too fast there. Um, okay. So maybe black doesn't have time to take on f4. Because if you take on f4, um, you lose a tempo. I'm still not liking pushing the h-pawn at all. I don't think that helps black's situation one bit. Um, on the other hand, white's never going to take on e5 because then black has two connected past pawns. So taking f4 looks like a crock of nonsense. Um, so I'm still not believing in this taking. Um, I don't believe that one bit. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd sooner play h4 here than take the pawn. I'm playing h4. I'm making an executive decision here, Stockfish. And you can't stop me. Okay. So now we take here. And we've got a... What's, if you count the material, this is a balanced endgame. With black having three pawns for the bishop. Um, 
practical considerations are that this is just really challenging. Um, so I'm just confused here. Um, I want to push e4. I don't want to take that pawn. Taking seems to give white a blockade, which is why I was hesitant to play h4 in the first place. On the other hand, if I'd not played h4, eventually white's going to take my pawn. But, okay, can I play something else, maybe? I don't want to take, because I think that gives white the blockade. We'll give Stockfish the benefit of the doubt for once and say that he came up with the right candidate move, but I'm not believing this. Um, okay, we, so we push... Now we do king d4. Okay, am I forced to take that? Is this forced? Wait. I don't believe that either. Okay. Now don't I just push f3? Oh, wait, no, the white's too fast here. Okay, so I don't have time for that. So I'm forced to take the d-pawn. This is why I didn't want to triple my pawns in the first place. Because um, now I don't have really any practical chances. Um, I mean, sure, yeah, we could try king e5. Uh, we can't push d5 here because then all our pawns go. Um, and on the other hand, we kind of have to try d5. Although, white's got these squares covered. So, what's going to happen is we're going to push d5 and then push f3 and then king f4. White's going to play king d4. And white's going to gain that square too. And then our king has no entrance. Um, so, that's kind of a problem. And yet another reason why pushing h4 is bad. Um... So what if I back up and say, you know what, fine, take my bloody pawn. I think we transpose back to the variation where white plays h4 himself. Um, okay, it's, yeah, it's important to deny black king e4 for a tempo. Um, let's see. So if I play king d4, I lose the pawn race for multiple reasons. Wait, so what if I don't play king e5? What if I just sack and try to do something clever? Okay, I'm being advised that being clever is not a good idea. White promotes one tempo too fast in all of this. Um, so yeah, Black's kind of forced to push h4, although it doesn't win for him. So then we go back. Did I miss anything? Oh yeah, so I was saying that this taking f4 just seems not to offer anything. Um, I'd rather play e4. But what's so terrible about this? Are we losing the f-pawn somehow? Okay, yeah. I'm seeing them getting zigzonged here. So, black can't win this. At least not by this technique. Um, so e5 to try to deny white's king access to the center doesn't work. Next variation, king d8. King e3. We're just going to play this as if we knew what we were doing all along. Go after the pawn. Um, okay, h4 has been useful in a number of lines. I can buy that. So this is Zugzwang. Okay, now we're forced to play e5. This is the sort of thing I was trying to avoid earlier. Um, okay, so bishop d5 forces the king away. And we take the pawn and go king here. 
drop the bishop back, triple our pawns. And guess what, guys? We're back in the same endgame. Um, same position. We've transposed. Um, you know, black still can't win this. Um, so this all goes to show uh, that black can't win that endgame. I mean, maybe back here, 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 way back here. Maybe Black thought that he saw something. I don't know what he saw, but that um, obviously he didn't see through all the complications like you and I did. So, just pragmatically, this is probably not the correct choice. Um, but that's, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's really difficult to criticize on general grounds, and that's just really tactical. But we saw a number of really interesting endgame positions along the way. Okay. Um, I'm still surprised that Black can't win that, but should I be? I don't know. And if I've missed anything... By all means, feel free to notify me about it and let me know. I'd be more than glad to go back and look at that again. Although we're not going to find anything, but let me know. All right, now for the board one featured game. Whew. Okay, so, oh yeah, that's some interesting opening decisions that were made. Uh, I'll stick out of that because... Opening is something everybody except me seems to enjoy studying a lot. Um, I enjoy some openings, but not all of them. I still don't understand what makes me so picky in some, but not others. So Astana noted that knight b4 would have posed some practical problems. Um, all right. And, yeah. Forget to what extent we actually covered this a4 stuff. Um, so, yeah, knight b4, bishop to, or king d1 is a much improved version of the line we saw in the other variations. Right. Um, no, I totally agree that this is very much improved over the a3 lines um, that Astana noted. I completely agree with this analysis there um, that uh, black is just struggling to hold on um, in this particular variation. It was really insightful. Um, F4, what pursues a defensive strategy? Yeah, this, you'll note that uh, if you start pushing all of your pawns, like he pushes a3 and he pushes f4, and if you're just pushing your pawns and not activating your pieces, bad things happen. Um, a4 is the best move in this position. Despite having previously played a3, you still need to activate your pieces. Um, maybe there's other ways to do it. But Astana's found this a4, and it looks sufficient to me. Um, rook d8, bishop e7. So white's developed. White's developed there. Um, so I think Zug and I were having some interesting discussion about possibilities for stuff on the file here. Presumably after... Um, yeah, after... I don't know that I like this rook d1 move at all. Is that necessary? If it is necessary, then it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. Oh, right, I'm sorry. We looked at d4 and all that. That was really good analysis, too. Um, uh, I don't have a way to break this open. Okay, so I must have just been imagining things. Do I wish to exchange on c6? Uh, no, not at all. 
just even on general grounds, taking c6 would leave us with uh, endgame where we have the wrong colored bishop. Um, that would be a pain. I would not want to defend that. Um, so, yeah, I actually think Stana's coverage of this last game was quite extensive. I'm not sure I can add much to it. He was suggesting rook h5. I don't know how he came up with that. Um, because the rook can't go anywhere from h5, so why move it to h5? You must have some really convincing hidden agenda here somewhere. I mean, we saw what happened in the game. Um, but my thoughts would be just play king e2 and develop the rooks via the a file. And what does Stockfish think? Is king e2 on the agenda? Um, yeah, so after some thinking at a depth of 22 or something, it's coming up with king e2. So I'm not completely off base in suggesting this, connecting the rooks, completing the opening phase of the game. Uh, Maurice Ashley once noted that if you connect your rooks, you've developed all the rest of your pieces. It's hard to say that about having the king between the rooks, but having your rooks connected can be really useful in general. Um, Stockfish likes knight a6. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. I'd much rather play rook a6 and then, um, then maybe bring my knight out somehow later to attack this pawn. But, on the other hand, if you don't play knight a6 right now, the knight's not getting out. So, I mean, black's in trouble either, or black's in pressure. Not in trouble, but just under pressure either way. Um... So bishop e4 is clever, but I'm not so easily swayed by just an engine evaluation here. Um, there needs to be a plan with it, and I'm not seeing a plan. Because, mm, well, there's no reason for the bishop to lurk back here. We know that the bishop does belong on e4 in a sense. Um, but I just don't like all this pressure that's building on the b-pawn there. And I would rather have my rook on a5 if I had time for it. This could make black's life quite uncomfortable if I'm able to... I don't know. I don't even know what I could do with the rook over there. But I need to know. Okay, so maybe the idea is that our king is too weak and we don't have time for this. This is really complicated, and I didn't see bishop f6 at all. Um, whereas if we back up and we play this, yeah, black cannot play g6 on account of, well, he's be denied the ability to play at bishop f6. And if he can't play bishop f6, then he can't break this open. So he's kind of forced to play h6 here. Okay, and now there's some reasoning to rook h5. Maybe there was on the other line too. But we've provoked a kingside weakness. And we can just beat the heck out of that weakness. It's not going away. This gains a tempo. Black's forced to defend. Um, whoa. Does bishop d4 seriously gain another tempo? Where are we going? What are you even doing, Stockfish? I get that you don't like the fact that b4 is attacked. Um, but making a random move like bishop d4 just to deal... Just to push uh, the threat of taking on b4 over the horizon just isn't a good idea. Yeah, the better long-term idea is holding on to the pawn. Um, again, you're panicking, Stockfish. I'm sure that knight is perfectly fine where it's at. Um, it's good to apply pressure on the b4 pawn. Yeah, I get that you don't want your knight on the rim, but the consideration of applying pressure to b4 is uh, important here as well. Uh, this is just a really challenging middle game position. There's not much to be said theoretically about it, because apparently white's not 
winning this by force, or if he is, it's not very easy to do so. Um, I'm not sure I even see white's threat, unless maybe it's to play g5, and then um, if black takes, then to double the rooks on the h file. So maybe that's the hidden agenda here for white. Uh, maybe that's what uh, convinces black to say, you know what, I give up. I'm not going to try to take b4 anymore. I'm just going to go back and try to defend my king. And maybe, well, we'll just assume that Stockfish is right there. Uh, I'm going to play g5. Um, oh, this makes sense. So I see you'd want to trade down and slow down this attack. Um, what's wrong with rook takes? What is wrong with rook takes? I'm not seeing it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not that anything's wrong with rook takes. It's that this is useful because it unveils um, protection of h6. Um, but we're still going to take h6. Black's going to take back. Um, I don't understand why g4... Are we still that committed to trying to open up the H file? That we would actually play G4 and G5 here. Um, I mean, I guess if I dawdle, this might not happen. Like if I play Rook B to H1, uh, breaking the H file open could be more difficult. Um, I'm going to trust that it calculated this right. Oh, okay, you think rook C, or knight c7's to play rook a6 if I play bishop d4. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was thinking you'd just drop back to b8, but maybe that's the idea, so you'd rather have the rook on a6. I was thinking, in, after, in hindsight, that knight d5 was the key idea behind it all. Um, still, why not rook bh1. We're going to take a look at this. Um, it's maybe the same thing, but maybe not. Maybe the point is that I'd prefer to have the rook elsewhere. <laughs> oh, that is cute, Stockfish. Rook to g5, just because we can. Okay. That's too cute. Um... Okay, then we exchange, and then we take the open file. Um, so playing the rook to h1 in the first place was a wasted move. On the other hand, we have our pawn back on g3 instead of vulnerable on g4. Um, so that makes it more difficult for black to exchange pawns, but we have a wrong colored bishop for this endgame. Um, so the fact that Black's king is so exposed and he's got so many weaknesses might not prove fatal. Regardless, um, now I'm curious about what's behind door number two. What if we play the move that the engine actually recommended? And it's shuffling here between recommending bishop f8 and recommending bishop, rook a6. Um, I'm not sure that it matters too much which one's played first, if both are played. So... What's so relevant about bishop f8 anyway? Oh, wait. The arrow went away. Did it change its mind? Yeah, it wants to play g5 here. And so... I guess the point is that obviously black can't take, but now if white takes on h6, well, no, we still had time for this. And, um, yeah, obviously if rook takes, uh, black's losing material. Um, that's hilarious that for a fleeting instant it recommended rook, take, rook takes h6. Um, that's got to be losing material, right? The point would be rook takes, rook takes, bishop takes, rook h1, king h, oh, king 
King H7. Never mind. Um, still, that's got to somehow be crushing if if he does take with the rook. So we're going to first play the recommended move. And then, no, this must be losing, right? I thought I saw something here. Okay, so it's not as crushing as I thought. There's no, like, immediate decisive tactic. Um, I was expecting that somehow this would just blast open, but uh, I guess not. Yeah, so we got to check and go back and um, try to hold everything. And d5 is loose. Uh, so black says a pawn for a pawn, and I guess white obliges, because it doesn't matter. Um, so we exchange the rooks, so it's less pressure that black can apply. We're not taking this. Oh, why not throw this in first and then take? Yeah, and this is just good for white. Um, Mm -hmm. I need to see this out a little bit more. Okay, so c4 drops, and white's up two pawns, and that's winning. Um, so, do I have any questions about this? Okay, so that all goes to say that rook a6 is not generating enough counterplay, and so the recommended move, um, which I thought was less interesting might just be the way to go here. White takes the open file. Okay, now I want to oppose. Yeah, we're going to oppose that on the diagonal. We take, we take, we make a threat, try to open things up a little bit, double on the threat. Are you seriously going to exchange pawns or exchange rooks here? Um, a rook exchange seems fatal. Okay, and white's not going for it. There must be more to this than meets the eye. Okay, I'm sorry, I miscalculated. The rook exchange is not fatal. Um, so we got this double rook endgame. I know every one of you love your double rook endgames. Wait, do we take e3 or do we take here? And surely we trade pawns, right? Except there's this tactic. Um, we want to keep the rooks on the board. Uh, we take here. Hang on. We take here. Protecting both of our pawns. Liquidate that. Oh, I don't have to take this right away. But that frees up my king to move. And frees up our rooks to move. And... Uh, yeah, we gotta trade off as many pawns as we can. I don't know why we're not... Okay, yeah, rook d5 is a good flexible move. Um, preventing king f6 from winning the pawn outright. Um, or rather, preventing tactics which allow black's king to advance further. And simultaneously threatening f6 check, causing havoc. Um, right, and if black plays king f6 now, we got rook c6 to counter. So black's got to play something. I'm not sure why it's not rook b6. There's probably some useful tactic like rook c6 when you push the pawn further. So we harass the king. Okay, stockfish sees a check, stockfish gives a check. Why b2? Why not b4? I guess it avoids skewers later. Um, we set up for a skewer. Oh man, Stockfish is trigger shy here. Um, wait, why not rook c2? Oh, it actually doesn't force an exchange. But can't I play rook c6 here? No, I can't. 
So that's the point, is we're shuffling around, trying to stop a skewer and a fork. Um, so this all goes to show that rook d5, while it sets us some cool looking tactics which impress the stockfish, is not nearly enough to win this. And that's kind of to be expected, because double rook endgames are not easily winnable. Um, so I think a number of pawns got exchanged there. Um, is there any way to reduce the number of exchanges? I think the only ways that reduce the number of pawn exchanges um, worsen this endgame for white. Could play king f2. I think, yeah, king f2 though, c3 happens, and bad stuff happens there. So let's back up a little bit more. Um, still, black has too many counter chances here. And so, yeah, exchanging on g7 gives black a free tempo for his king. We need every tempo we can get in this position to extract the most out of it. Um, so candidate moves are like rook f5 and rook a7. Um, rook a7 did eventually get played in the main line, so maybe that's where we start, especially because the rook isn't doing much else here. So we start rook a7, d4, we have to capture. Um, okay. Oh, I guess we're not making any real threats on the king side anyhow. Okay, so taking the A file was not decisive. Um, hang on, did I hit the forward button instead of the back button? Uh, See, so yeah, I was looking at G4. And we saw rook a6 is not especially interesting, and so there's bishop f8. And I don't like rook a1 anymore, because it's not attacking something on the king's side. Can I play g5 here to make some kind of threats? Um, so it's suggesting that we take on h6. That actually doesn't look too bad. Okay, and then we exchange. Um, rook d6 looks most flexible here. And then go over this way. Um, this denies f5, so black's eventually forced to play king h7 anyway. And yeah, you have a rook and bishop endgame, which has got complications. But this is better than the double rook endgame we were looking at earlier. Also, white has this pawn still on the board. Um, so white has managed to effectively gain, maybe not a pawn, um, but he's gained tons of practical chances in keeping around the correct pawns on the board. And opening the H file was instrumental there. It's possible I still missed some nuances in the position. Um, it's more than possible. It's very likely. Um, yeah, this bishop's useful on this diagonal. I was debating putting it on C5, but that doesn't seem to be worth it. Uh, I don't like D3. D3 looks like a waste. Um, just because we're exchanging pawns. Okay, Stockfish has come up with e4 here. e4 looks plausible. Um, Black doesn't have a really good way to harass our king if we play this, so... Our pawns are relatively strong, and we make a nice little fort there, or fortress. Uh, I guess now d3? I still want to advance my king. Although d3 is happening sooner or later, so why not just do this now? And it forces black to take, and we take back, and our king is getting active. Um, I don't like e5 one bit. Um, 
On the other hand, it's really tricky to find some other way to advance the king. So maybe e5 is the way to go here. But I'm feeling that with accurate play by both players, black can probably exchange off enough pawns to draw on this. I know Stockfish evaluates this as plus 1.9, so a lot of people will say, though, well, that looks pretty winning. Um, but I don't know. I just don't know. I'm really hesitant to put my pawn on e5. Yeah, there's been a lot of chess content today, and the 45-45 games have left a lot of things to, uh, both to learn and to explore, and a lot of things unexplored still. I'm sure there's tons of opening theory to be covered that um, some of us know better than others. Uh, I'm sure there's tons of middle game ideas still hidden in these games. These were, a lot of these games are pretty close, or at least um, pretty sharp, and um, there just isn't enough time to analyze these thoroughly ever. Um, so I guess the idea behind e5 is that uh, we're, eventually, we're threatening to push f5, at the same time denying black the ability to play f6 because we cover f6 already. It does limit the mobility of both the rook and the bishop, so there must be a pretty serious threat behind it. Um, but also, if we just play king d4, um, black, I don't know, I want to say he plays bishop f6 in response to king d4. However, I do not know. And our king on d4 isn't any further advanced anyway. Because um, to advance the king further, we'd have to like play rook h5 and king d5. And we we're stepping further and further away from this bishop, and the bishop's the sole defender of the pawn. So maybe this also, this e5 might give our king some inroads. Um, Yeah, I don't like pushing f5 immediately. It's just the more pawns we push, the more challenges we make for ourselves. But if you're saying that you know for sure our king doesn't belong up here, it makes sense that we centralize our king, so I guess leaving the king on d3 makes some sense. Um, Getting our pawn all the way up to f6 would be kind of cool. It would look nice there. Holy moly. Really? A rook exchange. Wow, I've been itching to trade rooks, except... Yeah, now that I see... I mean... Okay, we'd rather exchange on our terms. So the whole point of all this maneuvering nonsense is that, in general, a rook trade would be okay for black if he could just hold all the key squares. But if we trade with white's king on d5 and black's king nowhere near c6, uh, then there's no fortress to be had. So black goes back, we kick the bishop, we trap the bishop, um, yeah, you know, there's rooks operate well at a distance, and wait, why are we playing that now? I guess this gives our king the flexibility to move away from the f pawn when we need to. Um, yeah, blacks are shuffling, shuffling, shuffling. Waiting for white to do something. White's going to come up with an idea any move now, because white doesn't want to repeat this position. Okay, white's got an idea. He's going to go back. Um, I think what this means, though, is that black has established a fortress, because if white had an idea, white would have found it already. And so the fact that we are up the pawn and we have a really nice-looking position doesn't seem to be decisive here. Um, 
if there were a way to make it decisive, Stockfish would have found it. So Black is just barely holding on. It's pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, this goes back to my point earlier about why are we playing Bishop C3? It's because um, Stockfish is trying to just say, you know what, I'm winning. Can Black just resign already? I'm going to hope that he messes up. And Black is maintaining a fortress, holding on to the position for dear life, and apparently doing quite well at it because White's pawns are in the right, wrong squares. Um, I don't like f6, though. What about e6? Um, I know in general Black wants to exchange down, so let's exchange. I think black covers all the key squares, though, to maintain a fortress. Um, uh, what's that about? That can't be serious. That cannot be serious. Oh, there's the stalemate trick. Wow, okay. Yeah, the best white can do here, instead of taking the rook, is he's got to take the b-pawn. Taking the rook would be stalemate. Um, so that's black's key idea behind this situation here. Is that e6 cannot be played because such would force um, the stalemate. But... Uh, I know in general, in end games, you want to place your pieces first and then uh, place your pawns. Um, in situations where there's not just a runaway pawn, you want to make sure your pieces are on the best squares possible. Um, but I think Black has set up the ideal formation for his pieces. And he's correct in shuffling his rook to b7 to b8, b7 to b8. Uh, all while White can't seem to find a way to break through. Or at least it's non-trivial. Um, I was pushing back against this idea of e5 and f5. Uh, as much as I said that it's an idea, it's that I didn't like it. And maybe I was right. I don't know. Yeah, I think given enough time, the GM would see it. Um, so I think I was right in asserting that e5 and f5 doesn't I don't know, it just doesn't appeal to me. Maybe it's best, but I don't like it one bit. Um, so, for this, we have this possibility of playing bishop e1, just shuffling a bit. Um, I want to get my king to d5, if that's okay. Um, f6 looks really weakening. I'm surprised to see the computer suggest it. Like, that looks so completely crazy. Um, I mean, that yeah, that makes a huge target if I just play bishop c3. Not that I have to do that. I could, oh, okay, yeah, Stockfish is finally on board with it, so we'll do it. Um, I don't want my king back there, though. I'd rather have my king on d5. Yeah, finally Stockfish finds rook h5. Um, and so... Huh. I was thinking there would be something more here. Like rook h7. I mean, I get that it's fun to pretend to attack the f-pawn, but what about this? Okay, so we're going to activate the rook. Stockfish wants to run away like a coward. That's what the cowards would do. Um, it's probably fine. And so now what? I mean, this looks generally reasonable. Check. 
saw this coming. Okay. Wait, why rook takes? Oh, because otherwise we're forked. Okay. Wait, what's going on here now? So apparently this was a successful breakthrough, all made possible by that move f6, in my opinion. Um, just my opinion there. So we see that there's a lot of poison in this position. Um, a lot of tactics to be had to determine whether or not uh, white's actually breaking through. Um, wait, I uh, didn't mean to go there. Let's try throwing in rook h5 just for... Okay, this is probably why it was considering f6 in the other line, is that here f6 is actually forced. Um, I was considering bishop d4 here. If I can get away with that, we're golden. And I've just been making this whole exercise and ordeal way more challenging than necessary. Um, yeah, so apparently... I can force um, f6, and having forced f6, then I can play my bishop forward and force the bishop trade. And having forced the bishop trade, the rest is elementary. Um, so apparently that's an easy way to crack through. Um, so that kind of goes against this idea of king g8 that just kind of walks into the corner. Skeptical of king g8, is that really best? Oh, tactically it's forced. Um, but yeah, that king g8 is kind of a nightmare. Um, maybe this goes to show that bishop e7 is not so bright after all. And that stiffer resistance could be made somehow just by activating the king right away. Um, wait, what's going on here? Wait, bishop g7 forces an exchange that's terrible. How is this even a serious idea? Oh, it's not an exchange because the pawn's in the way. Um, not trading stuff because trades aren't happening. Uh, on the other hand, there's this awful weakness, and um, white's got to be breaking through somehow here. I wonder, if we do king f7, oh, I thought for a second there was going to suggest something completely nuts, which would be giving up the exchange for some kind of crazy endgame. Um, so yeah, we force this exchange. Now this is just terrible for black. Black doesn't want to defend this. Whether or not it can actually be defended is debatable. But I think backing up, black has tons of kingside weaknesses. And so the right way to approach this was the way that I suggested here. Um, where I'm forcing trades and opening lines on the king side, making trying to force black to play f6 to deal with his king safety problems. Um, and apparently I was successful, at least in some lines, in forcing that. I don't know if in all lines white can force these exchanges and force black to play f6, but to the extent that he can force black to put his pawn on the wrong color square, he can deal with this weakness and that weakness. And those two weaknesses uh, should be enough for white to be able to win against most players, if not in theory. So, sorry that that was just a flurry of variations. I'm sure there's tons of things left unexplored still. Um, but yeah, that's me analyzing 
using an engine which does not have an end game table base. Um, I'm sure it could provide deeper insight with better tools. I'm sure the tools will improve over time and greater discoveries will be made. However, I think there's still a great deal of practical value in looking at these games and seeing just how these endgames play out. In the case that, you know, I get an endgame that never looks remotely like one of these, I have a general idea of um, whether it's more important to push on the king's side to try to activate the king in the center, to try to activate the rook on the A file. Here, all the key weaknesses were located over here. And by harassing those weaknesses, you're actually able to tactically force F6. And by forcing F6, you have good chances of converting the endgame. Whereas if you try to push on the, if you try to put your rook on the queen side, um, black attacks down the center here and liquidates too many pawns. And if you try to move your king up the center too e early, um, it's just not successful. And black succeeds in building a fortress and has tons of practical chances just for stalemates and such. Um, See, so yeah, it's important to just put all your pieces on the right squares and exploit the weaknesses in the black camp. Um, B5 is a harder to attack weakness than just everything over here. And yeah, by forcing the correct exchanges on the king's side, we're able to get an endgame where eventually white's king can make it somewhere useful. But it takes a long time, and it's difficult for the engine to see it first. Uh, it's frankly difficult for anybody to see it first, but anyway. Those uh, are some additional remarks I had um, based on Astana's excellent analyses of these Lee Chess 45-45 Lee games. Um, I just thought I'd round out and take a look at all these endgame positions that arose. Uh, I think that was a fun adventure for myself. I'm sure some people here enjoyed it as well. Um, in any event, um, yeah, it's been a good exercise, and I hope you did enjoy it. Um, and if so, I guess I look forward to seeing you next time we do some either playing or analysis or whatever we end up doing. So uh, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys next time. Have a good night.